And I'm, and I'm weeping as I'm doing this and I grab this dope and I'm like, man, this is a lot of money. And I dumped it in the toilet. And when I dumped it in the toilet, hell broke loose. Well, I should say heaven broke loose because hell broke loose because the chains that fell off of me just fell. All of a sudden, I began to dance. I was doing like the holy Macarena in the bathroom again. And I'm dancing and I began to speak in tongues and I'm, I burst with this. It was like the Holy Spirit got a hold of me. And I, mean, I was so overjoyed. I never experienced something like that in my life. I was like, wow. It just like, I felt God's love so much. I was just weeping because he just touched me. My encounter was so real. So my name is James Lozano, um, 48 years old. Um, I live out in the foothills, Northern California. I'm married. Um, I have six children, two boys that are active in the military, uh, uh, and two other ones are plumbers, live in Monterey, and my two twin girls that the Lord blessed us with. Um, so, um, James Lozano's story, um, it's actually a love story. Um, you know, that's the way I see it. Uh, I grew up in a small town in the Bay Area by, uh, named East Palo Alto, a murder capital of the United States uh, per population. So it was riddled with violence, uh, drugs, uh, you name it. And we lived right on a dope spot uh, there. Um, I have uh, seven brothers, uh, three sisters uh, at the time. Uh, one of them has, has passed since then, but um, so I grew up with a large family, uh, humble beginnings. We didn't we didn't have much. Uh, my dad, having so many children, uh, you know, he refused to be on welfare or ask for any assistance. He figured that he had this many children, he's going to support them. So he worked two jobs. Uh, so my dad was gone a lot. Um, but so we uh, we from the beginning didn't have much. So my dad actually rented. Uh, a place uh, from a lady that she was uh, doing some work for, which was a chicken coop. And so my dad converted this giant chicken coop into a room and that's, that's where we lived for many years of our lives. And my dad ended up, you know, getting his money together and he bought a house. He's a very hardworking man. Um, so uh, as it's, things progressed on, um, my dad was actually my hero. He was my champion. I would, uh, uh, touch his, uh, the veins on his hands and press them and tell them they look like worms. And uh, I would touch his face, his sandpaper face, and I'm like, wow, I, I, I can't wait to, to grow and grab some facial uh, hair that I grow. And so I wanted to be like my dad. I, I wanted to have veins like him. I watched his, uh, the way he would stand and the way he would greet men. And he was, my dad was like a man's man. He was a hardworking man. And I, I wanted to work at the same factory he worked in. That's how much my dad was my champion. It was like, that was like King Kong to me. And about seven years old, uh, things began to change. Um, you know, my brothers, they were older, um, drug dealing, everybody, it seemed like the spirit of drug dealing just was in my family. And um, so my brothers are dope dealing, Every my dad's uh, going, you know, he's, things are pretty rough. Um, so man, uh, all of a sudden, uh, I remember the day my dad like broke me in, in, in half, basically. I was seven years old. Um, I was watching a show and this little uh, character that was a dog had a cape, like a Superman type figure. He would go and save people. And I was like, wow, I want to be like this, like this dog. I want to save people from trains that are coming and these villains. And I told my dad that I wanted to be like that dog. And my dad says, oh, you, you want to be a dog? Um, okay, get on all fours. I'll, I'll, let's, let's do this. So I, I'm thinking that we're going to play this game. I got on all fours and my dad uh, kicked me. He, uh, you know, kicked me so hard. I, I thought he broke my femur or something. I mean, I went flying. I'm, I'm a young kid. I wasn't big, little skinny dude. Oh, man, I remember it wasn't really the leg that, that we thought he broke, it was just my heart. Uh, this man that I look up to, this man that was my hero, my champion, my everything, it just, just beat me. And then it just continued on from there. My dad was drinking. Uh, so it was, uh, it was pretty tough. I developed a lot of resentment towards him and hatred 
Because the man that I loved so much and looked up to and wanted to be like him and around him as much as I could, uh, all of a sudden was, was beating me. And so my dad, uh, the beatings kept coming. Uh, I was like, for some reason, I became this target. And I, I was just, my mom would inter intervene. Um, so at the time, we didn't even have that much money. I loved when he go, went to work because I didn't have to deal with him. And, you know, I look back now and I see the Lord there. Um, of course, we were like Catholics by name, I guess. You would say we were like, so my mom would have her rosemary and statues of, you know, these saints and whatever. But we didn't really go to church. It was only like for, you know, special occasions or something. So didn't grow up reading the Bible or none of that. Um, so, but one thing, we were really poor. And uh, so this man would come and he looked like the colonel from KFC. And he would come to this, all like pretty much his Hispanic, uh, Polynesian and, and black uh, neighborhood, which was violent. And he would come, he didn't care. And he would bring us groceries twice a week. He seen the need and, and so he was out there. He knew we were, we were, we were pretty, pretty down and out. And he would bring us groceries. And we, we actually uh, anticipated his arrival all the time. And you know, when he would come, we would already be grabbing bananas, eating them, you know, while, while he brought this food. And, and um, one thing that he used to do, he would look at my mom and he would ask, my mom was really quiet. And he would ask my mom if he can pray for us. Can I? And he would put his hand up and, and, and lay and pray for us, these beautiful prayers, you know, while we're eating food. And I believe that those prayers were seeds. God was working even then. Uh, we just couldn't see it at the time. Um, so here, um, you keep going. I, I, you know, we have God coming, uh, providing for us, um, the local church. Uh, I never knew the man's name, never knew where he came from, but he was there. Um, so as time progressed, I started uh, really rebelling against my father. Uh, I despised him. so. He worked so hard that we didn't have no money. Uh, he bought a house, which was a miracle in itself. He's such a hard worker. Um, and so I began to sell drugs at a young age. Well, back cocaine, crack cocaine was like the, the, the greatest uh, thing out. And so right in front of my house, that's what we slang. We had like 30 guys out there and, and it was just crazy, uh, our neighborhood. And so now I'm providing for my family. Now I'm buying my sister's shoes. Now I'm helping out with the bills. I want to have the newest sneakers and things that we can never afford. And, and it gave me a, a sense of, uh, of worth, like I had something now. It, gave me, it made me feel awesome because my father struggled for it so much and I never asked him for a penny. I would dare not ask him. And so I, I hated him so much that I would put nails on his tires thinking that it would, they would blow up and he would drive off some hill and die. I, um, I actually, I had so many brothers and sisters that I ran in his room one time, which I only been in his room maybe about four times. I can count it in one hand. I had no business in there. And I urinated on his bed <laughs> and then ran out and someone else got blamed for it. And so this, you know, this is what's going on in my mind that I actually loved him so much that I wanted to hurt him. And this kept building up. Um, then I began to go to uh, juvenile hall, in and out. And my father, uh, just the beatings increase even more. I guess my father in his mind thought, I'm going to beat the bad out of this kid. And he just couldn't. Uh, after a while, I just, I just began to take the beatings. Um, I, I didn't even care anymore. Um, I ran the streets even more. Uh, my friends uh, became my family. Um, we weren't really in gangs. The Bay Area was different. It was more like sets. We lived on the block. So I guess you could call it a gang because that's it. You know, we we're all into like just committing crime. We hated police, authority, anything that had to do with against us. We were all dope dealers. We aimed at being these like, like, like big uh, cartel type. That was our goal, all of us. And in the process, you got a lot of friends that were murdered, killed. Personal friend of mine, I grew up with in a trunk of the car, shot. Um, some that were decapitated uh, going to Mexico, you know, getting involved with that, with that trade too, as well, the drug trade. And so we, we come from a all dope dealing. And so we have about a dozen personal friends of ours uh, that have been murdered. And um, 
that's how deep we were in, 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 this, in this game. Um, as time progressed, they ended up putting me away. Uh, they got tired of having me for weekends, a month, six weeks. Uh, finally, they put me away for like a whole year. Uh, I was 13 years old because I was just, I, I was just crazy. I was just like, there's no stopping me. Uh, the teachers would say, you're going to end up dead in jail or, or someone's going to hurt you. Um, you know, this is what's going to be your future. And my getaway with, with murder name was Johnny. We all had these thick names, you know, like, you know, that we were call ourselves. So mine's, uh, they thought my name was more fitting, Johnny. My friend of mine, uh, he said, I know what Johnny stands for. Just one hopeless, no good, nasty youngster. And I was like, man, that's, that's tight. So I, I wrote it down. And every time I would write it down, I would, I would write that definition of my name, that name. And so that's exactly what I was becoming. I didn't know at the time. So juvenile halls, I write it on the walls, so forth. I get out, uh, you know, my brother ends up uh, getting murdered. Uh, he got gunned down. Uh, remember my mom, just they're crying. At that time, they, they, they had him laying there for about three hours or so. So we watched the whole process of him being removed. Uh, it, it was awful. Uh, I remember the images of him uh, with the holes in, in his bodies and his head. Um, and I'm like, I'll never become like that. I'll never be out here like a dead dog. I remember just thinking that, you know, this is my brother who taught me how to fight, how to put my stand up, pivot, strike. And, and so it really like affected me. I became hard and really calloused uh, when that transpired. Um, I ended up getting in some trouble. Um, because of all that, I ended up shooting people, uh, gunning down some people. I ended up going to the Youth Authority. They sentenced me to the California Youth Authority. And uh, I was 15 at the time, and they maxed me out. They says, we're gonna give you to your 25 years old. So me, I'm like, wow, I'm 15 years old. They just sentenced me to I'm 25. Uh, I ended up doing five years in there. Uh, it was like one of the worst uh, times of my life because uh, the Youth Authority had no no boundaries. If you were weak, you're gonna get eaten up. And and that's exactly how uh, you gotta like become like animalistic type to survive in the California Youth Authority because you got a bunch of guys, 13 up to you're 25 years old. So you got older guys taking advantage of younger guys, sexually, mentally, I mean, you name it, it, it was crazy. Uh, the California Youth Authority here in Stockton. And so um, I was an occupant of that. And it's crazy because the first seed that was planted about the gospel was there. There was a man there by the name of Reverend Darwin. We call him Benjamin Darwin. Um, I hated him. He was a, a CO. Um, he, uh, we, he would mace us, take our food. Uh, I mean, we hated him. He was like a corrupt cop. But all of a sudden, he becomes this Christian. And he calls this crew the God Mob. He began to change the institution in there. But being a Christian in jail is like a sign of weakness. Uh, yeah, and that was like something I wasn't getting into, man. I, I was I was a gangster, man. I was a hardened. I, I'm a fighter. I'm not into that sissy stuff. But um, he came into the dorm and announced that uh, we've been so good that he's actually going to uh, bring in these girls that are Hawaiian from Hawaii, and they're going to do these hula dances for us, and they're going to have these little skirts with straws, and, and they're going to have these coconuts on their boobies, and they're going to perform this these Hawaiian dance. So we're all like, oh, yeah. And he's like talking about there's going to be four of them, and we're like, dude, this is it. So we're all get, uh, you know, shined up, dressed up, creased up. We show up, and there's no girls. You know, there's this big stadium, and, and we're like, this looks like a concert type setting, and all of a sudden, these, these guys come out, you know, and they look like these Polynesian guys, you know, we're like, what's going on here, you know, like, there's like hundreds of guys there waiting for these girls to come out, uh, so they, these guys start singing, and just the anointing of the music, it was a group by the name of Katinas, probably people are knowing it, their music began to minister uh, especially to me, it was really silent there. They began, their mom had just passed away, so they sung songs about that and then transitioned it over to Jesus. And I remember my heart was just tugging at me, just hearing this message. I have never really heard, you know, about Jesus uh, in that way. You know, everybody knows, you know, there's this Jesus out there, but not in that way. So uh, Darwin uh, brought that in, but I never took to it. I still just kind of blocked it. I'm in jail, there's no way I'm gonna become no Christian. Um, so anyway, I get out. Now I'm 20 years old, 
and I'm lost like a kidnapped kid. Um, I move in with my parents. Of course, I have nowhere to go. So I go back to go live with my parents and my dad and I, we didn't really, he never came to visit me the five years. Uh, so we, I get out with him and it's kind of awkward. You know, my dad's, we don't really talk much. It's just short things, yeah. You know, I respected my dad. I never disrespected him. I had a, um, he just, uh, he's always, I always had that, at least that for him, you know, where I, I never put my hands on him, nothing of that sort. Um, but I was so ashamed. I felt like just a loser after getting out here. I'm 20 years old. I don't even have a Huffy. I don't have any money to go buy like a soda. And I just really was like, I'm not a depressed guy. I'm, I, I'm you know, and here I, I kind of like got into this depression mode. Like, what am I going to do? Like, what am I doing out here? Guys are running around in cars, <laughs> you know, and like, it seemed like they're that flying saucers, you know, five years later. And, and here I'm like stuck. You know, I had this mentality of a 15 year old kid. Um, so I, uh, I began to plop uh, on a check cashing place. I was gonna rob it. And the whole purpose of that was that I wanted to go back to jail. Um, because in there, I was somebody. People looked up to me. I had a name, a reputation. Um, people, I was, I was down to fight. And so I was, I was known for being a fighter and a striker, you know, and, uh, and I liked that. I, I was somebody, but out here, I was a nobody. I felt like lunch meat. And um, I was at that point in my life where I just, I was going that direction. And then I thought to myself, I said, you know what? I, I have a gift. I can make money. I've always sold dope, you know? And so, man, I'm, I'm gonna go full blast with this. I'm gonna I'm poison everybody, you know? I'm gonna poison cops, kids, uh, uh, police officers, mothers, like everybody that I can poison, I'm gonna do it. And so at the time, uh, crystal meth was like really out there. So I went back to my neighborhood. A lot of my friends were uh, moving weight. Uh, you got my friends, they're millionaires and, and just in the dope game. So they had no problem just giving me uh, dope. Um, it was crazy, I get there and they, my friend actually, he says, man, we're gonna, we gonna hook you up. And uh, he actually gave me a, he said, pay me later. He gave me a 5.0 convertible, a GT. So I thought I was the man. I, I came back with dope and a car and, and I began to grind and make money like never before. I'm this street kid that is making hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, making an impact. I figured that if there's drugs out there, they gotta come from me. I want to fill up all the Bay Area with dope. The, my mind was so corrupted in the way that I was thinking. I was actually doing a great job at it. But God uh, had a different plan for me. My mom, which was, my mom would always be praying, but she didn't know Jesus, but she knew that there was a God. But my mom would pray like, Lord, send a donkey to reach my son, do something but save my boy, because my mom would have these dreams that, uh, and constantly dreamed that I was uh, crawling and, and I was cut up. Someone had really cut me up bad and castrated me in her dream. Uh, she constantly had these visions of me uh, being this way. And so my mom was really terrified of me. They see that I was like moving. Uh, I didn't trust people. I was really low about it. Um, so um, one day I'm out there, we're throwing a football. And uh, this guy comes up, and this guy come up by the name of Steve Acosta. And he comes up, he begins to talk to us. And right away, I just, I just wanted to kill it. I just said, get up out of here, man, kick rocks. You're not from here. What are you, a cop? And he goes, oh, no, no, no. And this is before Casting Crowns came out. This is back in 1995. He says, no, I'm just a nobody that knows somebody that loves everybody. And that was kind of catchy. You know, I remember smiling. I was like, that was cool, you know. And, and uh, it, this conversation started and he said he just wanted to make a difference out in the community. You know, he's all trying to make it better. And he says, you want to play some football? And I'm like, with who? Like, so he whistles and about 15, 17 kids. I mean, this guy's riding illegal. He's riding dirty. This, all these kids jump out. And he says, one condition, I could just pray for you guys. And I was like, yeah, we, we open to that. So he prayed for us. He developed, he started to develop a relationship with me. I told him my parents lived there lived there uh, and he would see these fancy cars i always had these fancy cars you know i had muscle cars and uh you know i like muscle cars you know hot rods and so he he would come he, he knew when i was there because he would see the cars and uh so he started coming on parole you know so he came one day and he caught me there and we would begin to talk and, and one day he invited me over uh which was kind of odd to me I, I didn't feel weird i had no friends all my friends were just dope dealers we just getting money that's all we lived for and he says, uh, 
uh, hey, I want you to come to my little girl's birthday party. And by now, he had gained up some 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 momentum on me, you know, because I watched him in the neighborhood uh, feeding. I see him giving out ice cream, praying for people. I'm like, man, this guy, he's a real deal. Just the, just the, the power of a witness that he was doing out there. Really, I, I was watching him. And I was like, wow, I began to have a lot of respect for him. So when he invited me over, I, I kind of like, I didn't want to pass that up. Uh, just out of respect for him. I went. I've never been around Christians. I went to this house and I'm like almost gonna drive away. And I got there, I feel weird. I don't know what to bring. I went and bought something and uh, you know, I figured you bring a present. And so, you know, I brought these, these gifts and they received me like I was royalty. They brought me in, sat me down. I, I was so nervous that I wanted to leave, but all these people were smiling. They had something in them that I had never seen before. And they were like, Hey, good to meet you. And I'm like, they're trying to hug on me. I was feeling weird, man. I'm like, man, these dudes are all trying to hug on me. And so it was like, this has got to be fake. This is going to have to be staged. This, this, they, these guys can't continue with this. They're going to run out of juice here, man. Like, I just couldn't believe it. Like, I've never seen something like this. So I left, but it just, it left me wanting more of that. Because I've seen the way his wife loved him. I've seen his children. Uh, I was just like fascinated with him, what I seen in him was Jesus, but I couldn't see it at the time. As time progressed, um, we were now in a full friendship. I trusted him. I told him where my house was at. I didn't like people knowing where I lived. And uh, he would come over, I would have lunch. And he was really gentle. The Lord knew that I was so callous that he knew that I was like an onion. And he was peeling me back one layer at a time. And and he, this man comes over and uh, he began to talk to me and he tells me the story about 99 sheep. I'd never heard the story before. He begins to tell me about the sheep that got away and this man went after it. He left the rest for this one. At the time, I'm thinking like, I'd have been with my 99. You know, I ain't gonna leave my 99 after that. Well, I'd have called that one a done deal. But he tells me this story and I'm really like into it because I respect it so much. And I'm like, well, that's cool. You know, and he says that, that sheep that was lost, it actually represents a human being. And that sheep is you, my friend. God has sent me out because you've been so lost, but he has sent you out because he loves you so much. Jim. He just began to hammer me. I had never heard the gospel like that. It was so alive that it actually be began to uh, hit my heart so much. I began to weep. I don't know, and I'm like, this is weird. I'm, I'm crying over this sheep story. Like, it just hit my heart because I feel something tugging at my heart. And, and, and he's like trying to put his arm around me. I'm kind of keeping him back. It was like, wow, like it, it just really like hit me. That time now this man, he says, I don't know, but the Lord has sent me. And it's something that he's seen in you and he's not gonna let you go. There's nothing you did for him to start loving you. There's nothing you can do for him to stop loving you, James. And you know what? God is crazy about you. He knows how many hairs you have on your head. His thoughts of you are more numbered than the sand. And he started telling me all these things about God. And I'm like, wow, like all this, this these, these details that God about me, these plans. And, and I'm like, wow. And, and it was like fascinating. But at the same time, I'm selling big dope. Uh, I'm being pulled in another direction. I love the man, you know, and I love what he was bringing. But I, at the same time, I was just so uh, in, 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 in how would you say it? Like just in a grip of drug dealing. It, it just like gave me excitement to make money. And I never used drugs. I, I, I smoked weed twice and I was in jail. I didn't like it. Uh, but I'd never been into the drug scene, never smoked, drank, none of that stuff. I tried a beer here and there, but uh, nothing big. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, uh, Steve, um, one day, I guess he was just tired. Uh, he was relentless, man. This man wouldn't stop. He would like show up. I would call him that he was worse than a Jehovah Witness. But he says, uh, I'm not Jehovah Witness, but I'm Witness for Jehovah. He turns it around. So he he came one day and he kind of gave it to me hard. He says, you know, what? what's your trip, man? You're going to end up in jail. Someone's going to kill you. You know what this, what this leads to, right? Uh, this is a dead end street, brother. And uh, you're a good kid. Man, you have a good heart. Uh, man, you remind me a lot of me. What, what's your deal, man? What's going to stop you, man? Prison? Uh, what? Come on, you're not, you're all these fancy cars, but you're riding around in these, these expensive cars that I, I can never afford, even if I dreamed about it. Uh, and, and he's telling me all these things. And 
I actually was walking out with a shoebox full of money that day to go stash it. And me, you know, that's a big accomplishment. Well, you know, you got you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. I opened the box and an arrogant move, like in an arrogance of, you know, displaying it. And I opened it and I says, you know why? Because this is what moves me. This is my God. And I showed him the money. And I thought he would look and say, wow, like this kid's really doing it, you know. And, and I seen the pity in his face. He looked at the money and he looks at me. What's the whole use of gaining all the world? Materials in your cars, but you lose your soul, my friend. I was like, wow, he goes, I'm concerned about your heart. There's no price tag on your heart. He goes, James, you're a good kid. I, again, I began to like weep, cause I'm like, man, this dude is like killing me here. Like, dude, like, I just like, wow. He, this guy just could see through all this facade. And one day, uh, uh, you know, finally I, I get involved. They came to rob me and got in a big shootout. Uh, I end up uh, shooting this guy that shooting me. End up now in the big house. I end up in San Quentin State Prison, the place that I thought I would never go to. So I finally hit rock bottom. I feel like the number zero. My son was born while I was in there. So, oh my goodness, it's like, I, I hated it. I absolutely hated it. I think that was one of the worst times because I, my mind was so everywhere. You know, I had, I, I was a somebody. I had all these things and all of a sudden I have nothing. And guess who comes to see me in, <laughs> in jail? My friend, Steve Acosta. He tells me, he begins to tell me, hey, mister. That's how he'd always call me, hey, mister. And uh, he, he began to talk to me and tell me, hey, how you been? And, and then he just starts. This is not God's plan for you, James. You know, it was never, and I got so irritated and, and I just stopped him. I said, you know, I don't, I don't want to hear about your God. I don't want to hear about Jesus. I, none of that, I, I, I respect you. I, I have a lot of, um, just a lot of love for you, man. But uh, all that Jesus crap, I don't want to hear it. And he kind of smiles, you know, and he goes, and I says, you know, uh, if God is so real, then why am I here? We were poor, man. We lived in a chicken coop. We, we try to do wrong to try to get right. I says, all our life we've been struggling. My brother got his brains shot out. My mom's crying over. My brother Val standing there with me. My dad, I says, you know, where was God then? If your God is so real. And, and he begins to, to kind of like, like laugh a little bit, you know, and I'm like, and it irritated me and he goes, oh, James, God didn't put you here. God has always been there. And God has always been there, he goes, you got yourself here. Your choices have determined your destiny. Choices have consequences, my friend. You've been out there, let's be real. You want me to be real with you? You've been poisoning people and all at the expense of your pleasure. You've been poisoning mothers, fathers, communities, and you think that there's no consequence to that? You really thought that you would continue on and you would just go for how long? And I got really mad, you know, because the truth was just like, it was just too much to, 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 to you know, like, hey, I'm just doing what I, what I can. I'm a product of my community. That's all I know, you know? So, hey, who are you to tell me how I am? And I was like, you know what? I don't, I don't have to listen to this nonsense. You come over here and you, you, you jamming me up, you know? And I started getting all hyped up on him. And, and he says, hey, you know what? Right now you're acting like a little girl. <laughs> like, a, what? I'm like, I really got irritated, you know? And I'm like, this dude, and he goes, you know what, I'm going to I'm like, you know, don't come over here no more. I'm going to do my time, and, and, and you know, and I'm going to go back to my cell. I, I don't need none of this, you know, and, and I'm mad, man. I'm, I'm like, and he says, you know, I'm going to let you go back, do your little time, go to sleep, you know, go do, take your girl nap, do what you got to do, you know. <laughs> and he says, but before I leave, young man, uh, life and death is in the power of the tongue. God's word, when it is spoken, doesn't come back empty. And so I'm going to speak something over you, boy, whether you like it or not. Those same streets that you, you poison, those same streets that you used to go out and bring darkness to, and the parents and families that you used to break up, and you were like a puppet in the, dumb, in the devil's hand, the enemy's hand, you will go back to those same streets one day, and you will speak life and bring light into them. It's been spoken over you, and it's been said in the name of Jesus. And he turns around, and he walks away. And I see his back, and I'm like, hey, hey, I'm trying to call him back. You know, I'm, I'm so angry that he's, you know, he's just leaving like this. And 
I go and do my time. I don't mean quitting. I mean, uh, now I got transferred to Solano State Prison. And that's where I actually met him at. One day I had asked him, where do you get your strength from? Where do you do, how do you do this? Coach kids, baseball, basketball, uh, out there doing outreaches on the street. And he looks up and he, the back of his beautiful, has a beautiful topography. And he says, he points to the hills. He says, I look up to those hills. My help comes from the maker of heaven and earth. And so I didn't know it was a scripture. And I was like, wow. So that always stuck with me. I was in Solano State Prison and I, now I'm walking the yard. I'm angry. I'm as bitter as you can get. I was those dudes that just hated. I was full of hatred that actually I would do push-ups nonstop, exhaust, until I get exhausted. I would run, do pull-ups. Um, I was just like trying to get this anger out. It, it, I had so much like anger and it, it was like my fuel. I wanted to get out, kill the people that, that actually shot at me, wounded me, uh, incarcerated me. I blamed them and I, and, and I was just so angry and I would walk the yard and I would see these group of guys talking about Jesus. One would be like a pastor preaching the word to them and, and I would call them weenies. I said, man, these dudes are a bunch of weenies. Coming in here, everybody dances to that tune in jail because they're scared. And here they are, oh, they weak, man. That Jesus nonsense crap. And that was a nice way of saying it, you know. And I would walk the yard, but I would look up to the hills that Steve would point to. It was the same hills there in Vacaville because the way that prison sits up, it sits up at the bottom of the hills. And I would look up and I remember he would point to those hills and say that's where his help came from. And I remember I would say to myself, where does my help come from? I would say that. Fast forward, you get out of prison. Now I've given over 10 years and something, of, over 10 years of my life to being incarcerated. And I get out and you would think that I'm gonna get myself together. I have a son out there that I, I need to straighten up. No, I actually got out and I'm like, I'm gonna get on the grind. If anything, I'm gonna be more incognito. Um, I would dress the part, I would put on a tie and I didn't even know how to tie it. I would act like I was just getting out of work with dockers, but I had all this dope in the back of the car, moving weight across the state. And now I'm like, gonna get into real estate. Now I wanna buy homes, now I wanna do these, I, I wanna up it to a different level. And now I really wanna kill all your police officers, all your children and, and, and poison them. And this was in my mind, I became worse and I would drive with a gun underneath my leg. And I said, if a cop pulls me over and they tell me to get out the car because I'm on parole, I'm going to shoot them. And I already knew what I was going to do. I already knew my actions. I had planned it out because I hated police. And this was my mindset. I had this mind of a criminal. I was so corrupted upstairs. It was just impossible. Like they say, you were three French fries short of a Happy Meal, my friend. You know, people had told me so. This guy, Steve, he never stopped. He never stopped. He would still come to my door. Sometimes I would hide from him because I didn't want to ask because I was like still selling dope. He would put a note on my door, Jeremiah 29, 11, buddy, you know, God has plans for you to prosper. I love you, buddy. I believe in you. Uh, God has a future for you full of hope and to prosper you. And, and I was like, man, this dude don't give up. And so he still continued in my life, still on the grind. Still would do other things, but he was still after this kid. He never actually stopped, which was just insane to me. Ten years went by, and I'm a successful dope dealer. I'm living like a king. Um, Jesus, nothing. Mm -mm. It's a joke. Um, I'm volatile. Uh, man, it, it's just like crazy. But now I'm like, I figured I know the game now. I know how to stay low key. I know how to play the part. I have a job, I work, but I also sell dope. Um, man, you know what uh, happened is he would always preach to me the word of God. Like they say, it doesn't come back empty. And he would tell me, he says, James, all you gotta do is call upon the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. God speaks your language. And so I was tired, just getting nowhere. I got two sons. I had everything. I used to have like one motorcycle just to stunt, another one to have nice car, all these things. But I just had this emptiness. And I would think sometimes like, 
how am I ever going to stop doing this? Like, I'm eventually going to end up in state prison doing life or someone's going to murder me because I, I just can't continue this. You know, I, reality began to sit in after a while. And I remember just being so tired. I guess I call it the bathroom ministry because I was going to go take a shower. And I remember just being sick of it, just being promiscuous, uh, catching one STD after another because being with women. And I felt like dirty because of it. And I was just tired. Um, and I remember just like, just saying, you know, God, if you're real, then come, help me then. I'm going to do this. I surrender. And I remember getting on my knees, crying out to the Lord. And I got in the bathroom and I began to weep. And I knew that I had to get myself in a kind of setting that nearby. So I went head first. I uh, went to the nearest church in Stockton. I, I, I got plugged in and I'm like change. I felt God uh, move inside of me at the time. I, I want to change. I, I'm ashamed to talk to men. I don't trust them. Uh, man, I'm callous. And here at church, I'm just eating up everything. I'm reading this Bible. I don't know where or what is scriptures because this man had actually given me this Bible, Steve. And he gave it to me on the second day that I got out of jail. And he says, a soldier always needs his weapon, and this is your weapon. So he gave me that. And so I, was, I had that Bible going through it. And um, so I'm doing things in church. Uh, I'm trying to get involved to serve. Thing is, I didn't stop dope dealing. I just couldn't stop. It was just too much money. And uh, what happened is that I just felt like a $3 bill. I was like, you know, I read this favorite scripture that I had, 2 Corinthians 5.17. It says, if you come to Christ, you become a new person. The old is gone, the new. And so I'm like, I, maybe I'm just the ones that would never, God couldn't save, you know, because I'm still selling drugs. But I was expecting more like magic. I was expecting God to have this wine. And all of a sudden, I have no desire to like, to sell dope. I have no desire to chase that kind of, that, that lifestyle. But God's not into magic. God's into miracles. And see, God was just so patient with me that the pastor at the time said, if you want something you never had, you got to go do something you never done. Go out and serve, become great in the kingdom of God. That's how you do it. So I went to Helping Hands with Debbie and Dan Smith, and that was a big game changer for me. Um, I'm feeling ashamed. I figured, hey, maybe if I tied on the, the money that I'm making from dope, you know, God will, will still have grace on me. You know, my mind was so crazy. Um, I was a new Christian, you know, I didn't know anything. So I go to this place that day, and what transpired there was just, it, it was just the, the game changer. Um, I was in the back, uh, you know, I, was, I had a lot of respect for uh, Dan and Debbie Smith because they were just amazing people of God. They were on fire, they, 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 they were just like, they were just throwing me out on the street to go do outreach, you know? And I was like trying to get saved by works. I was trying to do good, you know, like I figured I had to earn my way up to heaven. I, I, I was just crazy. Um, I'm bagging these groceries, sliding them. And then Debbie comes back there and says, uh, Dad, we need you guys out in the front. There's too many people. Uh, so they, they say, James, I, I need you out in the front. We, we need prayer warriors out there. And I'm like, I don't know how to pray. <laughs> you know, like, I don't know. So I'm like, grab this bag. I thought, you know, I'll take this bag and I try to hand it to this little girl. And the little girl looks at me and she says, I, I, don't, I don't want the, the bag. Um, I, I need prayer. My daddy's been on drugs. And he's been gone for three days. And, and I want you to pray for me. I want my daddy. Oh, my goodness. That was like my little boy. And I was a problem. I was poisoning people. I, it was so powerful that I, just, I couldn't even pray for the little guy. I asked someone else, and I walked away. I began to weep like a little girl. All of a sudden, I cared for this little girl. I was asking for prayer, and I, and I remember going in my car, and I'm, and I'm just like, I'm just like broken. Like God just like doing, I was like, I remember even asking, I'm like, what are you doing to me? Like, hey, you know, you, I, I'm crying like a little girl, and I'm slobbing, and I'm driving away, and I'm like, dude, this is like, why am I feeling like this? You know, and I, this conviction was so heavy in my heart, but I wanted God, I, I, I wanted the things of the Lord. You know, I knew that I had asked them, like, I just begin to do things, you know, when I asked them into my heart, and I was like, Lord, change me, help me, and I called on his name, and, and that's the prayer that I, I, you know, help, and I knew that what the problem was. Uh, I got home, and all of a sudden, I mustered up some kind of strength inside, I was like, I had, I started to remind, uh, 
re uh, remember the scriptures and I, I had them, you know, all the, all the time written down. And so it says that in my weakness, you would be my, my muscle and that, that you, you would help me in those times. And, and, and Lord, and, and so I, and you said I'm a new person. And you said that if, if I do my part, you're going to do your part. And, and I began to talk to him in my house and I grabbed this dope. I said, I know what I'm going to do. And I began to get angry. And for some reason, I, I started to develop, like all of a sudden, my chest started coming out. You know, I, I began to feel like a lion. I was like, I'm tired of you, you this devil. You've been lying to me. I'm not a dope dealer. I'm not a guy that poisons people. I'm not a killer. I'm not a hater. I, I'm a son of God. I, 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 was, I, was, I, was, I was a chump, but I'm a champ. I was, I was a punk, but I'm a prince. I, I was a sinner, but I am a son of God. And I'm, and I'm tired of living this way. And, and I'm going to go by that book. And, I, and, I, and I'm not going to stop. And I grab this dope. And I'm talking, I, I, like people might thought I was talking to about actually talking to God. And I'm, and I'm weeping as I'm doing this and I grab this dope and I'm like, man, this is a lot of money. And I dumped it in the toilet. And when I dumped it in the toilet, hell broke loose. Well, I should say heaven broke loose because hell broke loose because the chains that fell off of me just fell. All of a sudden, I began to dance. I was doing like the holy macarena in the bathroom again. And I'm dancing and I began to speak in tongues and I'm, I burst with this. It was like the Holy Spirit got a hold of me. And I, mean, I was so overjoyed. I never experienced something like that in my life. I was like, wow. It just like, I felt God's love so much. I was just weeping because he just touched me. My encounter was so real. I hit the streets with the vengeance. I went out <clears throat> going to the darkest places. I said, I'm going to reach the knuckleheads. I got so plugged up. I, I beat my wife and I, we youth pastor, we full-time ministry. We, we just got really involved. We wanted to give the devil a hard time, which we still do to this day. Um, and you know that, yes, this story you'll hear, it's a testimony, but I call it my love story because God is just so good. Um, at the time, you know, I got sick. I was still single and I was just saved. My dad, all my families saved, my sisters, my brothers. Uh, my dad became the sweetest dude, but we never talked about the past. And the way, the way I grew up, man, we just sweep it on the carpet, man. We man up, you know, man meat. You know, that's what we got, I got at the time. So we don't have to talk about that. But uh, I, I had to get a surgery they had to open me up, remove my rib and all these things. And I, I ended up uh, asking my dad, I called and see if I could stay uh, with my parents. But I was expecting to talk to my mother. And it was my dad that answered and my dad was like, are you, are you kidding me? Are you serious here? You're gonna call for that? And I'm thinking he was rejected and I was like, oh man. But he says, you're my son. You don't have to ask. You come here anytime. I was like, wow. I come back from the hospital and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty fragile because, uh, you know, they took that rib out, so I'm walking, so I couldn't really speak, my lungs. And as I'm walking, I, I arrived in my house. My dad was outside waiting for me. And he rushes to my aid uh, to, to walk me in. And like I said, I'd never really been in his room that many times. And he had the door open to his room with the sheets pulled back. He was giving me his very best. He was giving me his bed. And that was big to me. I'm like, and I, 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 I refused it. I told him, uh, no, I wanted the spare bedroom. They had four rooms. I'm like, you know, I don't need to stay in that room. And uh, my dad, he, he takes me over there and <clears throat> he lays me down by the back of the head, you know, my dad. Uh, all of a sudden I become like the seven year old little boy. My dad says, he looks at me and he, and he says, I'm, I'm sorry. And he begins to say, I love you. Oh my goodness. It was just so powerful because I waited all my life. I instantly reconciled my dad. We both crying. My dad hugged me. I buried my face in his chest. He's, we're both just weeping. And God just instantly healed us. And that's how good God is. You know that he even reconciled with my dad. Now my dad, he's like, he's my champion. Uh, this man is, 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 again, my King Kong, uh, my, my advisor, my counselor. And we walk around here, we, you know, we walk hand in hand. My daddy always calls me to remind me how much Jesus loves me. So I'm um, saved, doing outreach, um, you, you name it. 
uh, any kind of way to give the devil a hard time. The thing is that I still had issues. Um, you know, anger problem, um, volatile, that volatile in me. Uh, my wife one time uh, seen something that, you know, and she says, let me, let me pray for you. And I actually reached over and said, you know, don't do that. And it was a different tone. She said, I, the way I said it, the way, and she had been a lot on deliverance and I, 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 I wasn't with it. You know, you got all these uh, Isaiah's, uh, Sandoval's, you got all these uh, other guys talking about, you know, I'm like, I'm a Christian. I ain't got no demon. You know, I just got issues, you know. And so, hey, we all got them like, uh, like Bill Johnson says, you know, we all have buttholes. We just, nobody wants to see them, you know. And so, and if you do, you're weird. And so that was my thing, you know. And so I'm like, now nah, we all got them. You know, we all got issues. But uh, it was much more than that. You know, it, 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 it was as a, uh, and I, I, I would tell you this because, um, you know, my, my sister-in-law stole my car, and I'm a youth pastor. I was so angry that someone violated me, went in my house and did what she did. I, I was looking for her, these thoughts, that are these demonic thoughts of what I wanted to do. And I mean, it's crazy, that's not me. You know, but I, I, I didn't want to share it with people, you know. But I actually jumped over the wall where she was, I said, that's my car. And I flat the tires and put oil in the gas and destroyed the car. This is me. I mean, it's got to be real. My wife waited for me. She's like, really? It was late night. <laughs> this is James gone wild with the demon, you know? And so I, I'm just thinking, hey, I'm, I'm just, you know, lost my temper. Uh, my wife was really big on this deliverance. I began to be more open to it and listen a bit more. Um, I, I just didn't want to really you know, dig into that. I thought, I thought it was a bunch of hope, hocus pocus. The way I was brought up in ministry, that a Christian was, cannot be, cannot have a demon or be possessed or in any kind of way because you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. It lives in, and so the Holy Spirit lives in you. They both came mixed. So that's how I was brought up. And as I began to um, really uh, get more and study a little bit more about it, um, all these deliverances were on Christians. And, you know, so my wife set me up. She said, hey, I got to, I said, y'all, how you going to do that and tell me? I don't even, I don't need deliverance. How you? So I was like really against it. I fought. And these people that were on my uh, deliverance, it was uh, Kelly. Uh, so Kelly and um, uh, Chris, uh, Marty, another amazing man of God. Uh, and um, also um, uh, Marcella. So I'm trying to remember the name. So, so I'm going there. I drive up. And I'm like, I'm gonna leave. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get out of here, you know. So I roll up and I'm gonna leave. But I knew that it was uh, Marty, and I and he had a reputation. Uh, well, he still has, you know, for just being a strictler for the gospel, you know. And he, he's real, he's real about it. He's a real man of God. And so, and I'm like, man, if this cat, uh, you know, I know he's real. So I'm a. And then I seen Kelly. When I rolled up Kelly, and she, I thought she seen me, so I'm like, man, now I really can't go. You know, I got to go through with this. You know, so I was, I was almost gonna leave, and so I rolled up at the house, and I'm going for deliverance. And so uh, Marty explains that I come in, and I'm really tired. I have my arms crossed, you know, and I'm like really short, and I'm just thinking they're gonna pray over me, and it's all good. And so they begin to, you know, get into it and and really find out more. And, uh, and you know, it, it, it's so crazy because they begin to pray. And this deliverance becomes like three hours. Um, demon manifested. I was on the floor. Uh, my shirt was over my face, like I wanted to hide it. I was on the ground, like slivering. Um, I remember seeing the couch in front of me, and I wanted to like hide in there, like a snake. Like I remember those thoughts. And what happened is I began to, um, I was on my stomach on the floor and my back began to arch up, my face towards heaven, my feet up. Marty, uh, he began to levitate. He was like an inch off the ground. I mean, it, it was, uh, it was like an exorcist type scene. You know, it, it was crazy. Uh, I remember being in it, acknowledging, but I, I didn't think this is uh, me. My stomach was so tight and burning. Um, for people that don't believe it, it, it's real. Here I am, a believer. I'm a Christian. Um, yeah, with a demon. I remember grabbing uh, Marty's hand, and I was so strong. Uh, Marty told me as well, and I grabbed his hand to like, 
I wanted to fling him and like throw him out like through a hole in the wall. I remember feeling that feeling and, and the authoritative words, do not touch me. You know, and it was like, I let go immediately. You know, and, and that was my deliverance. Um, it, it was very, uh, 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 I mean, out of this world. You wouldn't think that that would transpire inside of a Christian, uh, inside of my body, but it did. Um, I was delivered that day. I was delivered. Um, I mean, it took hours, but uh, man, it, it was, I needed that. You know, and Marty, he, uh, he's just so uh, gentle with it. He keeps checking up on me, making sure, you know, that this thing don't want to come back. You know, it comes back with seven others, you know, so. Uh, but yeah, Marty kept up and, uh, you know, I do. I, I finally, um, after all these years of being a Christian, that was the icing on the cake. You know, and it's crazy that it took this long to figure that out. So for me to, to my pitch to Christians would be, or any people that wants to get rid of these generational curses, uh, things that want to keep on with the children and so forth, get rid of it. Don't do that to your children. Don't do that to yourself, to your marriage. Because I lived in that anger. I, I, I lived and, 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 it, and it worked through me. And, and I've seen it now throughout my life where I was being uh, demon influenced. And so that was my deliverance and uh, took place with that. And, and you know, this is how good God's been. You know, that I didn't get what I really deserve. God gave me so much grace uh, and forgave me. And I'll never stop living for the Lord. I, ha I came from such darkness that he pulled me out of that pit, that Murray pit. And this is where I am today, to be blessed and living with my wife and children. So this is the, the James Lozano story. If you have a supernatural encounter that you would like to share on camera, please visit SupernaturalEncounters.com to submit your testimony.